you can get out of here. And we're continuing on our series on spiritual fitness. And we're sort of talking about the idea of fellowship this morning. And uh, I don't have to tell you how important Christian fellowship is because you're already here. Right? It's all the people who are not here who need to hear this. Uh, or all you people online. Uh, come on in. Join us in person if you can. Um, but praise God, we talk about the idea of fellowship. And I think one of the tragedies throughout this whole pandemic has really been the separation of people. And getting used to that, it, you know, it, it's funny because as we start unrolling things and, and start losing the mask, it, it's weird. Like I said, we walked we went to a funeral last week, out uh, last Friday, outside. Plenty of space, people wore masks, and it felt kind of weird actually seeing people, right? For what they look like. And we're so used to that distance now. It's amazing. Just a year, we've been kind of programmed in and, and try to unwind all that. But I think so many people have been really suffering from loneliness. You know, we have so many ways to communicate. We have, you know, you got your phones, you got your internet, you got Facebook, all these ways to get connecting with people. But yeah, I believe that we're more lonely than ever before. You know, talk to a lady and she's like, hey, you know, I have 2,000 friends on Facebook. Woohoo! I said, but how many real friends do you have? She goes, not many, right? I mean, don't get me wrong, it's great to have these connections and stuff like that, but to have friends and family and a community around us, and God has provided for us this community. We started with the idea of fellowship. You guys, you know, do I really need to kind of define what fellowship is? But the big part for the Christian is the church. Church provides so much for us. Church is so important. Uh, Christ has described the church as the bride, his bride. His love for us, his care for us, and we are united together. One of his prayers before he uh, died on the cross was that his church would be one for unity going forward. And I'm a big believer now, not just because I'm the pastor of the church, but I'm a strong believer in the strong local church. You know, you can go online, and like I said, we got some people who listen to this, and they're all over the place. But it, it, this is no substitute for the church. You can say, well, you know, I can, go, I can stay home and pull up YouTube and find a better preacher. Oh, yeah, you don't have to look too hard. You can find a lot of better preacher any day of the week. But there's something that happens when God people get together. What is the church kind of? We want to say this is in Matthew, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he said to them, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered to them, Blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has now revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock will I build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I know some people will say, Well, Jesus was saying Peter is the rock the church is built on. That's not true. Actually, Peter, uh, the Greek word is different. And so what he's telling Peter here is, look, the the church is going to be built on that testimony that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He was the Christ. He is the Savior. He is God come in person. He is the one who died on the cross for our sins. That is the foundation of the church. And we are welcomed into that all through the blood of Jesus Christ. And in that, we are related to each other now. We are family. You're stuck with me. But we are family in the family of God. And that's a blessing to have. You know, I've spent most of my adult life far away from my real family, my biological family. And it's funny, because when I was younger, I, I didn't even think twice about it, you know. Actually, I used to kid around and say, you know, I get along really great with my family because they're all 1,500 miles away. But I'll tell you something, over the years, especially as I watch, you know, some of you, you know, you can't throw a rock without hitting a family member, right? Uh, some of you guys are, and you guys, oh, all the, all the hassles go along with it. Let me tell you something, you are blessed because I've lost a lot by not being with my family. 
and sharing that. And what a blessing that God's family has been to me because you really are the only family I have close to me. The church is simply just means called out one. If you look at the Greek word for it, it just means called out assembly. We are called out. And we're called out of the world unto himself. And in this, you know, Jesus talks about my sheep hear my voice and they know me. And I picture Jesus the shepherd who crawls out into the world and some respond and come out. And hopefully you respond to that. And you've heard God's call in your life and you respond to this and said, I want to follow you. And we leave the world. We, we leave the wilderness. We leave all those things and come to follow Jesus and where he goes. And now we become this new flock. And all these exercises we talk about here, you know, prayer, fasting, Bible study, worship, and now fellowship, are all exercises that we practice, that we may grow spiritually. And fellowship is just one of those aspects that's so vital for us. Truly it is. I mean, you know, we live in our society where church attendance has been down. People are off doing their other things. I'm so busy. We, we, we are able to do things. You know, I remember as a kid, uh, even playing in sports and stuff like that, nothing was done on Sunday so that families could go to church. And that's gone now. Now, you know, I, I talked to a coach. I said, why, you know, why are you doing this on Sunday? You know, my daughter, is, you know, if you have it during church time, our daughter can't go. And you're like, well, this is the only time. Everyone's so busy doing everything else. Uh, we have to cram those times, those opportunities. And I said, did you even think, you know, I don't even think about church. Most of our kids don't go to church. Church isn't that important anymore. Sports or all these other activities are more important. And I think that's why we're getting into a mess that we are. But I'm a firm believer that what is important to you, you will find time for. And as Christians, we really need to seek, you know, some of the things of this world are fun and, and some things are enticing. But we can't do it all. Let us choose wisely the things that we get involved in. Acts chapter 2 is really kind of the cornerstone. We start talking about the early church and what they were doing. And, and the church grew. I mean, thousands of people were added to the church daily. We see this growth taking place. And this church, without the format, without the building, with all that, we see this growing. And we look at this and we're like, oh, wow, how do we go back to kind of that fundamental? Acts chapter 2 kind of describes the, the atmosphere, if you will, or the function of that early church. And it says that it continues steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and prayer. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods, and divided them all among uh, all as everyone had need. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and about that day 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayer. And we see this, I want to use the word revival, but we see this, this gathering together of people saying, look, you know this church thing? I want to be a part of it. Right? And, and part of, I think, our duty, our responsibility is as a church, as we function, as we do what God wants us to do, as we love each other, I, I, I truly believe the strength of the, of the church is our love for one another. We're going to get into that in just a little bit. But if we love each other, we care for each other, the world's going to look at that and say, hey, I want that. Right? What's different about you? You know, we talk about this whole pandemic, and, and you know, I have people say, Pastor, y'all, aren't you freaking out? I say, well, my stress level has gone up a little bit. But I, I'm just trusting God. I have a hope through all of this. I have a church family. You know, I, 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 I can tell you how blessed I am as a church of how we work together and talk together and encourage each other. All through, and even know how different we are. And so I want to point out some real quick things about this Acts chapter 2 passage. First one, it talks about unity and faith. It says, and they continue to sit fast in the apostles' doctrine. One of the things that binds us together as a church is our common belief. Now, it's interesting because you can tell, do we all see eye to eye on everything? No. But we start with the fundamentals that Jesus is God, that I'm a sinner, 
and he died on the cross for my sins. I believe in the inspiration of Scripture that God's Word is just that. It's God's Word for us today. It does not change. Right? We can agree on those things. Right? Now we can get further down the line. There might be some things we might kind of disagree on later on. But in the fundamentals, the core of things, we have a, a common unity that binds us together. And especially as I think we see this world going the way it's going. And I think a lot of people, even if they're not believers, I think fundamentally, I think they know down that some of these things just aren't right. And they're looking for something else. And folks, as we stand upon the standard of God and His Word, I think we will become a beacon for those who are lost, who are looking for answers. And Jesus Christ is that answer. But doctrinally, we stand. The, Amos says this, how can two walk together unless they agree? That part of being that church, right, even though we're very different, different personalities, different heights, different ages, right, different generations, all these things that are so different among us, yet because of who we believe in, it unites us together. And that is greater than the differences that we have. Think about that. My love for the Lord Jesus Christ can supersede the generational gap. You know, I'm at that age where I'm kind of between two groups. You know, uh, I, I just still kind of blesses my heart. I haven't heard in the last couple of years, though, so I don't know what's going on. But, you know, I have some of the, our older members have turned around and said, you know, we like having a young pastor. I haven't heard that like the last couple of years, so I, I think I'm aging. Right? And then you've got the younger ones who are like, man, you're an old man. So I'm kind of, I guess that's what middle ages. I'm kind of stuck between the, between the two. You know, kind of on the, not quite over the hill, but on top, sort of teetering. But the difference is we can get together and we can have fellowship with one another, all because of what we have in common, our love for the Lord. Fellowship is time. It says that to continue to fasting the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. It's interesting, in the early church, they gathered, uh, not just weekly, right? I, I think it's hard, we, if I'm going to be honest, as a church, you know, I'm counting how many people are here, I was like, man, if we got everyone here all at the same time, this place would be full. But you guys are kind of like herding cats. You know? And, and you try to get everyone all here at once because we're all scattered out doing different things and all that. Right? It takes time. But the early church didn't gather just once a week. Actually, Acts tells us this. So they continued daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their, uh, ate their food with gladness and piss in your heart. That this idea of fellowship was a daily thing. Now, I wanted to be together with God's people. They are my friends. They are my family. They're my sanity check. Right? They're my help. They're my stay. That, all these things. You know, I mean, you know, I'm probably preaching to Twitter because we have people who you know, aren't here who probably need to hear a message like this about being in together. But church isn't, you know, like your job where you show up and you punch your card and and I sit down for my hour, and I get up and punch out, and I'm done. Okay, I did my church. We are the church. And no matter where we are, we are the church. I was talking to a pastor. They said, talk about the pandemic and one of the side effects of it. And they're like, you know, it's really closed off the church. I said, you know, I find it really interesting because once we shut down the building, all of a sudden we were doing drive-in services. We were forced on the, I never did Facebook before all this, and now our sermons are online, and we're doing, interacting on that, and uh, I, I noticed one of my friends on Facebook posted, he goes, you know, drive me nuts, because all of a sudden all these Christians are showing up, putting on verses, and putting on sermons, and you know, it's like, yeah, well, you guys forced us onto that, you shut us down, um, but I think one of the blessings, if I dare say this, one of the blessings of the pandemic is the church doors have been opened, and the world has got to see what takes place on the inside. And I don't think we're quite as crazy as they think we are. At least some of us. And they've seen it, and I think it's an attraction. Because you can't stop the church. It's, it's not the four walls. They can lock this door. They can burn this building down. But God's church, His family, His people, will continue. Amen? And it takes time. And, and we have so many things that take our time that buy for our time, that tempt our time, that leech our time. And I think that's why the Scripture says that we need to redeem the time, glad back some of those things. 
Because a lot of our time is wasted on things that don't matter for eternity. To invest in God's people, in his church. We have sharing. Fellowship is sharing. My daughter comes up to me and goes, Dad, what are you eating? I'm like, nothing. She goes, well, Dad, you know, sharing is caring. If it only works one way, though. Because if I ask her what she's having, she doesn't want it. But anyways, the early church says, look, they continue to sit fastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Now, it's interesting because the, the concept of breaking of bread has two aspects of it. One is just fellowship. You want to really get to know what someone is? Eat with them. Right? In church, we're kind of formal. We're on in and out. You know, but if you want to really get to know someone, invite them out for a cup of coffee. Invite them over to your house for, you know, for dinner. Sit down and eat with someone. And I don't know what it is, just because you're going like this, that your guard goes down. But you really see what people are like. Our aspect of this is, has to do with communion. And the scripture oftentimes refers to the breaking of bread as communion service. And that's the thing that brings us all together. Because no matter where we are, it's through the blood of Jesus Christ and through his body that we are united. We are equal. The cross is the great equalizer. But in here, once again, we talk about, it says, now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to what? Break bread. That aspect of it, in the early church, they like to eat. They must have been Baptists. It says, now all who believe were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and good and divided them among all as everyone had need. Oh, it was interesting because in the early church, what happened was they knew each other well enough that they knew and there was a struggle. I know you're hurting, right? I know you're sick. How can I help you? You know, to bring meals, to bring encouragement, right? To love and care for each other and so much so that, look, this is what I have. You know what? You can have it. That care for one another. But that takes time. It takes energy. It takes knowing each other. Right? My heart always breaks when I find out, you know, oh, so-and-so was in the hospital this week. Oh, I didn't know. I wish I would have known. And then I kind of kick myself. It's like, well, I didn't I know. Right? How, how, how could this slip past me? Yeah, I know we can't do everything. But our heart's desire should be so in tune with each other. You know? When someone's not in church, and it's funny because, you know, as pastor, I'm kind of in a catch-22 because, you know, if someone's not in church for a while, hey, I missed you. And all of a sudden they think I'm putting on the guilt. Right? And I'm not doing that at all. I, I truly, you, if you're not here, I miss you. I love seeing you. In another week or so, I'm going to probably hug you. I'll warn you. Right? But all these things going in, the, the family, the unity of that. Not because of guilt. I want people to come because they feel guilty. I, I want them to come because this is where they belong. I always think of, uh, there was a TV show on I, I, called Cheers. And I may or may not have watched it once or twice. But, but I always thought, you know, wouldn't it be great to start off church with, sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. Right? And I'm like, I said, I don't, who, I don't know the rest of the song. I it's probably, probably bad, so I probably shouldn't say this, so scratch it. But I always caught that, you know, that's what, that should be the church's theme song. Right? I want to go to church. I want to be there. I want to be with his people. I want to hear the word. I love everything that takes place here. And you miss that, you know? I was talking to a pastor and he goes, yeah, he's afraid that his congregation has gotten so used to listening to sermons on the couch that they're not going to come in person. And I'm like, you know, I appreciate everyone who listens and my mom is listening. And, uh, but there's so much you miss by not being here and touching base with each other. To share. And then prayer. It says that he continued said fasting the apostles doctrine fellowship and breaking bread and in prayer james tells us this confess your trespasses one to another pray for one another that you may be healed the effective for prayer of a righteous man availeth much i can't tell you what a blessing it is to be able to pray for one another 
You know what? Are you hurting this week? Let me pray for you. You're going to be my prayers this week. I've encouraged you time and time again. If you're out during the week, if God impresses someone on your heart, stop what you're doing and pray for them. Because they might need that right then. Pray cover over them. Pray for peace. Pray for healing. Pray for strength. I'll tell you, it is an encouragement to me to know that people are praying for me. And I can draw from your strength in all those things. That's fellowship, being united together in all these things. Fellowship is necessary. Why bother with all of this? I tell people, well, you know, church is full of people. You know, I'd love church if it wasn't full of people. But church, fellowship is needed. One thing is needed for is for the functions of the church. Ephesians goes through and talks about the gifts. And it says, And he gave himself some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and pre teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Right? The Bible is, is clear in teaching that each one of us is given a gift from God. We are all different. You're unique. You have different gifts and you have different abilities that God wants to use. And as we get used, it, not for ourselves. You know, whatever gifts you, and you all have gifts. You know, I always, I kind of joke around, you know, my gift is I talk and I eat. You know, so I'm, I'm as gifted as a five-year-old, right? Because I'm amazed at some of the gifts that you guys have that God has equipped you with. You know, I have a guitar. It doesn't make that noise when I hold it. Right? And some of you are gifted in various things. The Bible lists out all different gifts to be used, not for yourself, but for others, for the church. And church is a place for us to exercise our gifts, to minister to one another, and in that, become fulfilled. Folks, if, if more people were involved, so much more could be done. I think it's been planned out that probably 90% of the work is done by 10% of the congregation. We've gotten so used to the church being a place where I just go to it and it's all given to me. Let me tell you something. No. Church is a place for you to come and be a part of and for you to give. And in that giving, the church grows. And as it grows... More people get involved. As more people get involved, the more it grows. Fellowship is necessary for maturity, to grow in the Lord. Ephesians, once again, tells us this. It's still we come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to a measure of stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by the cunning craftiness of deceit plot, plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, who is Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. <sighs> Notice what he says here. For us to grow. Because what happens is, as we interact with each other, I mature. As I interact with people who are different from me, who I love, I get changed. As I minister and serve, it changes my attitude. I always kind of joke around. I said, you know, you see there's two types of people. There are doers and there are complainers. You know, it's really hard to complain when you're involved. Because when you're doing it, right, it's hard to criticize when you're involved. I mean, you might grumble, but... Right? The church needs less people on the outside pointing fingers, saying, hey, you know, hey, pastor, you know what? You should do this. And pastor, you should do that. Or pastor, you, right? Oh, this needs to be done. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa! What does God want you to do? Right? And I've found the truth over the years. You want to give your pastor a heart attack. Ask him, say, Pastor, what can I do? <gasps> I'm coming, Elizabeth. You know, this is the big one. Right? And our society has trained it that, look, this is what. 
But as you share, as you interact, you mature and you grow. As we get together and hear His Word and have it having its effect on our hearts, we grow and we mature. Church fellowship is necessary for support. Hebrews tells us this, forsaking out the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much more as you see that day approaching. Folks, I don't know if this is the end times, but we're getting closer. As we see this world going down, we need each other more to encourage each other. You know, parents, as you're raising your children, you need the church to help you and encourage you because the world's going to tell you to, to, to pump all this worldly stuff into your kids. And they're going to make you feel like you're an oddball. They're going to make you feel like you're strange. Hey, you know what? Praise God if we can have other families who are standing on the same thing and we can stand together. When we see what's right and what's wrong, that we can stand together in faith. I need that encouragement. You know, I have a few times where I, you know, I preach the message and someone's like walking out and say, well, Pastor, you're brave for preaching that. I'm just preaching the word. But I'll tell you, it's an encouragement for people who want to hear it. Timothy warns of people who have itching ears, and there are a lot of churches now who are looking for people who are just going to tell them what they want to hear and not tell them what they need to hear. And pastors now, more than ever, need that encouragement to stand firm on the Word of God. Because the way things are going, I, my wife's been following a, a couple pastors in Canada who have been arrested for having their church services. And that's Canada. Could that come here? Yeah. You know, someone asks me, goes, Pastor, are you, are, you know, Facebook, and I don't like what's going on politically with Facebook and all that stuff. You go, are you going to take, you know, I said, hey, as long as we can preach the gospel and we can share, I'll be there as long as, you know. But one of these times, I'm like, there's a few sermons I put on there. I'm like, yeah, this is going to get, Right? So I might end up in Facebook jail, or I might end up... I, I, I'm, I'm convinced that probably within my lifetime that I'll be fined or arrested for preaching the truth of God's Word. I, I, and I need your encouragement to stand. And some bail money. We'll see how that works out. But in your... Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those that weep. Now, in this together, right? Not just in the joy time, but in the hard times. Right? I mean, last week I shared, I just had a horrible le- week last week and just things and piling up and financing and everything else. And I had so many people reach out and say, Pastor, I'll pray for you. And we had someone encourage us. And I'll tell you, I needed that. Right? We, as a part of the church, because we are broken or because we're hurting all these things, church becomes a place where we need to be real. I don't want anyone to come in here and think, oh, I'm, I'm playing church, and I'm fine, and I'm okay, i sit down, hallelujah, all right, sit down, amen, all right, and then you go home, and then you're like, <sighs> Church should be a place where we don't have to play the game, where people will love us, warts and all. That we can come and say, you know what, I'm, I'm hurting you. We can find someone who says, you know what, can I pray for you? That's what church is about. Where we can be real. The Bible lists out in about 50 verses, 59 verses, all these one another's of the scriptures. If you boil them down, kind of the repeats, it comes out to about, roughly about 28 scripture references where we are told to function one to another. It's hard to function with one another when we're not together. Whether to love each other, to pray for one another, uh, the fellowship to encourage, to care for. All these things. To search out the scriptures of how I'm supposed to be reaching out to others. And I'll tell you, I take care of, I think, a lot of uh, mental health issues. If I can get out of myself and serve others. I think we spend a whole lot of time stuck up here. And we can get out of ourselves. Fellowship is necessary for the gospel's sake. For the gospel's sake. I remember a couple years ago, I was talking to someone in... They weren't a believer. And they're like, you know, they thought that a Christian shouldn't go in the public and talk about his faith. You, do the, you just do that at home. You just do that in your little closet. I don't care what you do in your house, but don't, don't bring it out into the public square. 
And it's like, I think there's a lot of Christians that kind of do that. I'm, I'm a home Christian or, or a Sunday morning Christian, and then the rest of the week I'm just like everyone else. And you know how effective that is as a testimony? Zero. When people look at us and they're like, why? You, you're the same. Why, why would I pick that? What advantage is Christianity? What benefit of it? Like I said, I think through this pandemic, I can't tell you how many times I've had an opportunity to share with people the hope I have because of Jesus Christ. But Acts continues on. It goes, so, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And look what happened here. As the church began to function like it should, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Because it becomes attractive. Hey, here's a group of people that really care about each other. Here are people who really love each other, who will reach out to someone, who will care for you. You know, how are you doing? I'm doing, you know, I'm having a hard time, but praise God, I got a church family. People are like, oh, I wish I had something like that. And here's the best thing about church. We're not an exclusive club. Come on in. Come on in. Our doors are open. Everyone is invited to come and be a part. But the key of it comes down and says, By this, all will know that you are my disciples. If you, what? If you go to church, is that what it says? No. So if you get money in the plate? No. People will know you're my disciple by, if you put a little fish on the back of your car. Right? Is that what it says? He said, they will know you're my disciples by your love for what? One another. How we interact with each other. Right? How important is church? Right? And I'll tell you, I mean, I don't want to be legalistic about this. Let me tell you something. It is a powerful thing. Hey, you know what? We're, a bunch of our buddies are going out on Sunday. It's, this is hard for me because this is my job. You know, I tell people, you know, hey, let's go off and do I said, I can't. I got to work on Sunday. Right? I know. Um, but in here, say, hey, look, you know, why don't we do this? He said, I can't because I have church. Well, wow, well, come on, you know, right? So, no, church is important to me. I get to see his people. I get to be in the Word. I get to all these. This is important to me. I'll tell you, that will have an impact on the person. Because you, what you're telling them, this is important. My God is important over some of these other things. And I will do a priority. And I'll tell you, that becomes attractive to the world sometimes. Especially for those who are seeking. And as the church, as we function as the church, as we, as we do these things, I believe the church will grow. As you reach out and invite your friends and invite your relatives and reach out to your neighbor and say, hey, come on out the church. Come on in. Well, I don't know. Oh, come on. It's great. The pastor is really weird, but the people are wonderful. Oh, okay, that sounds like fun, right? Yeah, all right. So all these things go out. The fellowship, as we participate in all these things. Final thoughts. Right? Time is slipping away. Final thoughts. First thing, fellowship. When we talk about the idea of the church and getting together, the first thing is I want to encourage you to come. That's half the battle. Right? If we all showed up, what encouragement that is for one another. Right? Right? It's interesting to the dynamic changes here in the church, right? Uh, you know, it's just a few of us. I mean, it's great together with God's people, but man, when we have a church full, isn't there a, isn't there an elevated spirit in that? And, and, and you encourage each other. I'll tell you, one of the best things for churches to grow is actually have people. You know, someone comes in the church and look around and say, no, no one's here. And they're like, all right, huh? You know, they're gone. They're not coming back. They come. To be a part. You know, this week I was thinking of writing this. I was thinking, you know, John Manick was a man who faithfully, every time this door was open, he was here. John Doak, another man. And they've gone home to be home with the Lord. And I've talked with so many pastors. You know, remember there used to be people who were so committed that every time the doors were open, they were there. They were involved. They were active. They were volunteering. They were doing all that. And one of the biggest problems they have in churches, I don't care what size it is, is that people don't want to commit. 
People don't want to be faithful. And the church is suffering for it. Second thing is get involved. What can I do? Right? I have gifts, abilities. I can just show up. Right? What, how can I serve? And start getting involved. And as you start getting involved, you get sucked in more. Because let me tell you something. You are the church. You know, it's hard. I talk with people and they're like, well, does your church do this? Right? Well, it could if you come. Right? Be a part. Be involved. And there's so much, so much that can happen within the church. But we just need people who are willing. And then you have ownership in that. Because I'm not the church. The building's not the church. You are the church. And the last thing is to build relationships. Build relationships. Get to know the people in the church. And some of that's through eating together. Some of that's in, throughout the week. Call someone up. But build relationships. Invest in people. Invest in the church. So you know what's going on. So you can pray for them. Encourage them. Meet needs. All these things start happening as the church becomes tighter. But not exclusive. We always, always invite more in. But that's attractive because in this world it's so much conditional love that's out there. And God says, come. Fellowship. Folks, we are designed for that. So this pandemic, I think when this is all said and done, they're going to start doing studies and they're going to sign mental health issues. Substance abuse, all these things are high because we've been isolated from each other. God designed us for fellowship. Right? I need you. And you need me. As we function together, as the church moving on together. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, church isn't the walls, it's not the programs, it's not even the style of music. Lord, we are the church. And we bind us together, Lord, in your love. You unite us together in who you are. And Lord, help us to love each other. Help us see each other through hard times and through the struggles. And Lord, help us to rejoice in the good times and praise you for your blessings. Lord, elevate this church in you. Lord, we ask this in your name.